Um, I usually write poetry and essays. Uh, I have been working more on my fiction lately, and I would like to share one piece of fiction out of this book. Um, this is called, uh, and again, this is about reflection. In this case, literally reflection. Um, and it's called The Mirror. Are her headphones on? <laughs> this is my friend Linda. Linda works with me. Work, we work together. And this is her daughter, Emma, who's five. And so I just want to make sure that she's okay. All right. Okay. <coughs> and Rachel, you're okay too, right? Ladybug, you're all right? <laughs> so, asshole, what are you going to do? No answer. This is deep brown eyes locked on the equally deep brown eyes opposite. I said, what are you going to do? Huh? Make up your mind. Another unresponsive stare. Man, I wish you'd knock that shit off. Diz turned to the man lying in the bunk above his own in their six foot by ten foot cell. What'd you say? You heard me. Jailed for the third time in his 25 years, currently for drug possession and use, Branford was familiar with street crazy. The showy bravado effective to earn position or reputation or credibility. Yet this old man truly made him nervous. Branford glared at Diz from his top bunk. Stop talking to yourself in the mirror like that. Oh, what's the matter? Does it bother you? To be honest, yeah, it does. Branford turned full on his side. You've been acting like some nutty ass old geezer for weeks, man. Is that why they call you Diz? Because you act all dizzy and stuff? The kid wasn't entirely wrong. The truth was, John's mother loved jazz and had named him after her favorite trumpet player, John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie. However, the innocent nickname came to mean something more ominous as John's erratic temper and dark behavior earned him half a dozen trips to jail for petty offenses as a teen. Then, when dark turned deadly, a life sentence for murder 24 years ago. Diz usually explained the unfortunate evolution of his name to the prisoners that passed through his cell over the years, most who were too young or too stupid to know Dizzy Gillespie, much less care about jazz, America's most significant cultural contribution. Normally, Diz wrapped the story in a good natured, I know I'm an old man laugh, a joke about how in this sorry case, life and art collided in a way that no one could have anticipated, certainly not his sainted mother. He was impressed that Branford had somehow pieced together enough facts after only a few weeks together, or at least had picked up enough information from the prison grapevine to connect the dots about Diz's past. Though Branford's conclusion wasn't entirely accurate, it was close enough for jazz, as the musicians like to say. Still, today, Diz didn't feel like schooling this boy on the finer points of jazz or irony or anything else. Attention he'd never known gripped his mind like fingers, struggling to grasp a ball that's slightly too big for them. Plus, there was no harm in keeping the kid in the dark a little bit. If nothing else, the rumors about his past infractions gave Diz a slight upper hand in a place where any advantage was golden. He purposely kept his answer noncommittal, neither confirming nor denying Branford's conclusion. Diz offered only a conciliatory chuckle. <laughs> You're pretty smart for a young punk. Really, man, I don't much care. I just wish you'd be quiet so I can get some sleep. Ain't no one going to answer for you from the other side of that steel. Well, you seem like a good kid, so I'll try to control myself. But the truth is, somebody is going to answer me. Branford sat up in his bunk, hunching over and ducking his head slightly before it scraped the ceiling. Who? It sure ain't me. No, not you. Me. Man, now I'm totally confused. What do you mean you're going to answer yourself? Diz backed away from the stainless steel mirror attached to the stainless steel sink, adjacent to the stainless steel toilet. He leaned against the wall on the other side of the cell, facing Branford. We haven't heard. Heard what? This is January 2017, man. Dude, I know what year it is. I didn't smoke that much crack. <laughs> There's a new law this year that lets a few inmates go before the end of their time if they change something about themselves. Diz's eyes twinkled with the prospect of freedom after nearly a quarter century behind bars. Who told you that? I talked to my lawyer not three days ago and he didn't mention any new law. Branford dropped from his bunk, his bare feet hitting the concrete floor noiselessly. Diz quickly crossed in front of his cellmate 
and sat on his own bed. Branford spun around to keep Diz in his line of sight and nearly tripped on the toilet. Diz liked to do things like this, knowing the tight space they shared was even tighter for those unused to navigating it. Sixty square feet is a lot smaller than it looks like in movies. One more way to let the new guy know that the old guy was in control. Well, I can't speak for the quality of your public aid attorney, but I got this directly from the warden herself. She told me and a bunch of other long-timers that the state has a new clemency program. Hey, you, you do know what clemency is, right? Yeah, yeah, asshole, I know. Just because I did a little dope doesn't make me stupid. Diz cracked a thin, teasing smile. All right, I just wanted to be sure. I know you druggies sometimes can't remember your own names, much less understand big legal concepts like clemency. About fed up with his cellmate's riling, Branford did not return the sharp, humor grin. Go on, ma'am said flatly. Anyway, she said the state is going to give early parole to ten lifers who quote-unquote redefine themselves. Redefine yourself? What does that mean? A long, hollow silence ballooned inside the cell. Well, Branford's volume rose like a child waiting for the end of a bedtime story. Diz rose from the bunk and paced like a caged animal back and forth from the barred cell door to the concrete back wall. He stopped and stared up at the three foot wide by two foot high window on the, in the center of the wall, seven feet from the floor. The window was too high for anyone to reach. Even if he did think about escaping now and again, six bars sectioned the window into narrow gaps reached only by the sunlight, which shone mockingly in the moorings on the floor in long, cold, muddy gray stripes. Diz gaped silently at the window for another 30 seconds. She didn't say, women piss me off, man. They say half of what they mean, and then you're just supposed to figure it out some, somehow, figure out the rest. And God forbid if you get it wrong. <laughs> Branford, who had a serious girlfriend, understood and laughed. Diz spun quickly on his heel to face his cellmate, his eyes now flecked with frustration and anxiety. I mean, I can't change my past. If I could go back to when I was your age, I would change a million things just to get rid of all the guilt that eats me alive some days. I can't change who I am here. I don't pretend to be no model prisoner, but I do my best to keep my head down, to fly under the radar. I do my work. I keep myself clean. Mostly, I just read my books and listen to my jazz. To what? Jazz? Branford saw an opening. Like a boxer, he jabbed playfully, flicking a verbal punch at Diz. Oh, you mean that old man stuff you listen to? Man, I don't listen to anything that was that come along since before I was born. The thinnest hint of a smile creased Diz's face as he mentally scored a point for his cellmate. Touche, punk. Yeah. No, really, man. All joking aside, I think the answer is right in front of your face, Branford said. Diz stepped quickly toward Branford, hands waving, voice rising, exasperation exploding. What do you mean? This is my life in the balance, and she's talking in circles like the Riddler from Batman or something. I feel like the top of my head is coming off. What is the answer? <clears throat> Branford cautiously put his hands on Diz's chest, a dangerous move to make with a man doing a life sentence for murder. Slow down, brother, Branford ordered. Sit down for a second and just breathe for a bit. <clears throat> Diz collapsed onto his bunk and cradled his head in his palms. Branford talked low and slow, as if to a child in the throes of a temper tantrum. Except this child's tantrums could hurt many people, and had killed at least one <coughs> for allegedly looking too hungrily at his baby sister. Look, the warden said you had to redefine yourself to get out of here, right? You're absolutely right. You can't change yesterday. Yesterday is what it was, right? And you can't change today. That's not in your control, at least not in here. As if on cue, one of the ever-present guards sauntered by, peeking in and trying a little too obviously to eavesdrop. Diz stared at the guard and sighed. You got that right. So the only thing you can do anything about is tomorrow. I don't understand. What do you... Come on, man, say what you mean. Change your tomorrow. She said redefine yourself, right? Well, redefine your tomorrow. Does it mean change your politics or learn to control your temper, take up a new hobby, earn a college degree? I don't know. You're the only one who can figure that out. 
And I sure don't know how or why that would let you get out of here, but I bet that's what the warden's talking about. Women are always saying something like that. It's confusing as all get out, but in its way, it makes sense. Redefine yourself. Let go of the past. Make a new future. No one can do it for you, man. You've got to do it yourself. Diz raised his head and stared intently at Brandon. He couldn't believe that this crack-smoking kid had produced such a simple yet profound insight. A sudden wave of guilt crashed on the shores of his conscience. Listen, man, I... Then just as he was about to apologize for everything he'd done and thought about his cellmate in the couple, last couple of weeks that they'd bunked together, the same guard appeared again in front of their cell. Diz, let's go, the guard ordered. Invisible hands magically unlocked and opened the door. The warden wants to see you. <coughs> Diz rose from the bunk, turned toward the guard. One second, please, sir. He turned back to Branford. Confusion and fear and exhaustion conspired to etch new lines in his face, adding to those that middle age had already dug. But his eyes sparkled again with excitement. I'm not sure what's going to happen here. I don't know if I'll be back. I hope not, Brandon said. Nothing personal, but I won't miss you talking to yourself in that mirror. Diz smiled, turned his back to the guard, shook Branford's hand and held it. He squinted hard, effecting his best dirty, hairy <coughs> stare. If I don't come back, just know that it's completely your fault. His eyes widened as a grin replaced the mock scowl. And if I ever see you again on the outside, I won't be holding it against you. <coughs> Based on what I heard about you, that's good to know. I said, let's go, the guard barked. I have more to do to than be your personal escort service. Diz reached the front of the cell in two short strides. He looked right and peered at himself in the steel mirror. Something looks different, but what? He broke his gaze. Oh, by the way, he looked over his left shoulder. My mom named me for Dizzy Gillespie, the great jazz trumpet player. Just thought you should know. Yeah, I know. Branford's sly, crooked grin confirmed that he'd figured out Diz's secret long ago. <coughs> My mom loves jazz, too. She named me for Branford Marcellus. Diz exploded with laughter. I should have known. Why else would anyone name their kid Branford? The guard grabbed Diz's left elbow and guided him down the corridor as the cell door clanged shut. So, as we continue to move through this journey, things are getting better. Learning to kind of adjust to my kids and, what, and their new lives and my, <coughs> life, my wife and us looking across the kitchen table and seeing only each other and having to figure out what it means to eat for two again and uh, our, our, our middle-aged Friday night shopping days going to buy groceries. <laughs> we have fun. Still, life isn't perfect and I'm by no means perfect. But I have come to learn a very important lesson, that the biggest things in life are often, indeed usually, the ones that, are, that seem the smallest, like spending time with friends, four of whom are here. This one's called Jambalaya. It wasn't even an entire evening, just a few hours really, grains, on the, uh, grains of sand on the beach of time. Yet on just such grains, is the foundation of lasting friendship built. Three married couples of varying degrees of life experience, which, yes, is AARP speak for age, including my wife and I, including a wonderful early June excursion in downtown Joliet's New Orleans North Festival. Good music, fabulous food, engaging conversation, lots of laughter, and abundant opportunities for watching colorful people of every derivation available in a major metropolitan suburb in 2016. What could make it like, what could, what could make it better? Only the chance to do it all with people who share your interests, who appreciate or at least tolerate your pretzeled sense of humor, who indulge your cranky, it's been a long day and somebody better feed me soon demeanor, <laughs> who have heard more than any 20 people should ever have to hear about your personal and professional woes, yet patiently listen to your new tales of terror, or worse, your old ones rehashed. People who have lived your life and celebrated your successes, 
and dreamed your dreams and felt your frustration, who have been shoulder and ear and hands and heart, people about whom you care deeply, because you know intuitively in the darkest room of your soul where such sustaining knowledge is kept and protected, that they care about you too, even when it runs against reason and benefits no one to do so. Mirror images? Not at all. Indeed, the real fun, the true magic, comes in the differences. Each divergence is a precious gift. The glory in the surprise of opening and exploring. A new chance for conversation and education. Seeds for new growth. Glue cementing bonds that may bend, but are not likely to break. Having grown solid and strong in their endurance. And so we, the six of us, ate and talked and laughed and drank kvetched and teased and laughed some more, neither demanding anything fancy nor expecting anything in return, just the cool evening air filled with rousing jazz and blues, our spirits mixing like the spices in the jambalaya dished up down the street, becoming its own thing, existing only in the times that we share, the soul of friendship pouring into us like the sweet hurricanes flowing from the bar taps, floating around, enveloping, <coughs> almost physically hugging each of us, soothing past hurts, fueling this moment, building a bridge to whatever comes next together.